Final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 14678 in the name of Jim Eady on reinstatement of the Edinburgh South Suburban Railway. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I'd invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Further remind members who are leaving the debating chamber to do so quickly and quietly. Uh, Mr Eady, if you're ready, seven minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we move from the controversy of the budget debate to what I hope will be the consensus of this debate. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to bring this debate before Parliament this evening and thank members from across the Chamber for supporting the motion in my name. I pay tribute to all of those people who have been involved in the campaign to reinstate the Edinburgh South Suburban Railway over many years. In particular, I would like to thank Lawrence Marshall of the Capital Rail Action Group, CRAG, a constant and consistent advocate for the reinstatement of the South Sub, along with Paul Tetlaw and Colin Howden of Transform Scotland. It is their commitment and their dedication which has kept this issue alive. And the South Sub route has endless possibilities and potential. Reinstating the South Sub could act as a catalyst for an integrated transport plan for Edinburgh, one that is truly fit for the 21st century, one that our capital city both needs and deserves. The station at Gorgie could serve Heart of Midlothian Football Club, Craig Lockhart could serve Napier University, Blackford and Newington, the University of Edinburgh, and a new link to the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, stemming from the current south sub station at Cameron Toll, would vastly improve the transport options for both patients and NHS staff, and would serve the ever-expanding bio-quarter. Politicians calling for the reinstatement of the South Sub have come and gone. Indeed, I'm reminded of the train journey on the South Sub line that was organised by Lawrence Marshall in 2000, which included former MSPs Margot MacDonald, David McCletchie and Robin Harper. I can't be alone in thinking what a fantastic journey that must have been in the company of three of the best politicians this Parliament has produced. Who knows if their journey that day was on track or whether it went off the rails. However, I am pleased that the cross-party consensus that was alive that day has continued to the present day. I have always been convinced that there has been a good case for reopening the line. After meeting last week with leading officials from Sheffield City Council and the South Yorkshire Passenger Transport Executive to learn about the UK's first tram train development, I believe that there has never been a better time to look again at this issue. Edinburgh is set to experience an exponential growth in its population over the next 20 years, with studies showing it will increase by almost 30 per cent if current trends continue. These figures clearly show that we cannot continue with the current transport infrastructure in place and that new plans are needed to be brought forward. I am reminded of the words of Enrique Peña Losa, former mayor of Bogota, who states, a developed country is not a place where the poor have cars. It is where the rich use public transport. And this is where the South Sub can play its part. The existing infrastructure is already there and is currently used to carry freight through the city. Previous studies have shown that if trains were to be reinstated, it could attract over 10,000 passengers every day. Consistently and without fail, our roads are congested during peak times, and this option could help to dr drastically cut both congestion and travel time. Taking more people off the road would undoubtedly help with meeting our carbon emission targets too. Of course, a business case needs to be made before we can start thinking about a functioning South Sub. For this proposal to be successful, I believe that it has to be put into the wider context of what is best for the people, the environment and the economy of our capital city. But we know from previous studies that the business case does exist. Journey times from Haymarket to Cameron Toll is, according to Travel Line Scotland, between 25 to 32 minutes. The South Sub could do it in 15 minutes. The Atkins Feasibility Study of 2004 concluded that the South Sub had the potential to have a benefit cost ratio of well over 1, 1.64 to be precise. Now, I have met with a number of key stakeholders, all of whom have expressed an interest in this project. Now is the time to revisit a feasibility study to see if the South Sub is still viable, which I and countless others firmly believe it to be. 
I was pleased to have had a positive meeting with the leader of the City of Edinburgh Council, Andrew Burns, just before Christmas last year, and I hope that the Minister will agree to meet with me and the leaders of the Council to discuss the potential for a new feasibility study. However, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, it is necessary to address the logistical and other practical hurdles that would need to be overcome before this can become a reality. Reinstating the line using traditional heavy rail may be difficult, given that Waverley is almost at full capacity, something which the Minister has confirmed in correspondence uh, to me. However, using a tram train, which would use both rail lines and the tram network, may, and I stress may, be the best way forward. Tram trains would be technically feasible, the technology is not new and has a proven track record in Europe and will be trialled for the first time in the UK in Sheffield from 2017. However, there are issues with the solution. Platforms, as we, as we know, trains have high platforms and trams have low platforms. If the South Sub was to run on both rail and tram lines, the tram train would need to be able to lower itself so that vehicles are accessible for disabled people. Voltage is another issue. Just yesterday I was emailed by a constituent to remind me of this point. I won't get too technical here, but suffice to say, heavy and light rail run on two different types of voltage, 750V DC and 25K AC. But the tram trains being built for the Sheffield programme are dual voltage and can change through the flick of a switch. I'm also aware of issues surrounding the existing infrastructure, signalling capacity, electrification, and the need for refurbishment of existing stations for passenger use. In particular, the needs of disabled passengers would have to be accommodated. One of these changes, challenges, that of electrification, is set to be addressed as the South Subline will be future-proofed as part of Network Rail's Control Period 5 plan, which is currently underway. The other issues are not impossible to resolve, but would have a cost attached to them. Nevertheless, the fact remains that Germany has used uh, this model with some success, showing that a mix of heavy and light rail can utilise a city's infrastructure so new public transport links are available. So what would a reinstated South Sub look like? With capacity stretched at Haymarket and Waverley, the South Sub could be reinstated fully, serving all the old stations between our two main hubs without having to enter into them. We could incorporate the current tram network into the existing South Sub and also offer innovative expansion plans for our current tram network to enable the two links to meet and create a loop. A different phased approach is also possible with the introduction of a rail link between Waverley and Morningside via Portobello, then moving to tram trains with the introduction of a new light rail link to the ERI stemming from the opening of the South Sub. After this, we could see the South Sub take on a number of different forms over the coming decades, utilising the existing tram network or integrating with future uh, tram extensions. The possibilities are endless if we think creatively. We have a massive opportunity over the coming months with talks ongoing over a city deal for Edinburgh and the wider city region. It is envisaged the UK and Scottish governments could commit £1 billion of investment, unlocking the potential for new and sustainable transport links. This could well be the answer for extending the transport network without having to raid the funds needed for other vital services, while ensuring that as the economic opportunities expand at the BioQuarter and King's buildings, that there is the light rail infrastructure to match. In conclusion, presiding officer, in reinstating the South Sub, we have the opportunity to think big for Edinburgh and for Scotland. Given the challenges facing Edinburgh over the next 20 years, I firmly believe that this is an idea whose time has finally come. Many thanks. I now call on Sarah Boyer to be followed by Cameron Buchanan. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I also intimate to colleagues that I have given notice to the Presiding Officer that I will leave early, but I promise to look at the official report afterwards, particularly the comments of the Minister. Um, I very much want to welcome Jimmy Dee's debate today and congratulate him for securing this debate. And I also want to join with him in thanking the Capital Rail Action Group for their lobbying, their research, and for keeping the flame alive of the South Suburban route. It is potentially a transformative piece of infrastructure and it is a huge shame that Edinburgh Suburban Railway was closed to passengers in the 1960s. Um, I know that my school driveway was the South Sub. I know there's a fantastic North Edinburgh um, cycle route that was our Suburban Railway network. And if you think about the congestion and air quality problems we have in the city, 
um, and you compare us with other cities, it is a huge missed opportunity. But the lack of access to rail is something that we need to think about. And as Jim Media said, there are issues of adding capacity, issues of adding connectivity, and a description of the loop that linked the university, Hearts Football Ground in Gorgie, and the hospital. And I'd like to add on the issue of urban regeneration, in particular add the issue of Craig Miller, an area that successive governments have been looking to invest in. There is a real social justice and economic opportunity that would come from adding a new railway station in Craig Miller. And Jim Eady was right to point to the work that's been done in Germany and Sheffield, the idea of tram train. I would also add the issue that Chris Harvey, a former colleague uh, in this parliament, used to talk about of train bus. There are opportunities that are being looked at. It happens in Germany, it's being looked at in other cities in the UK. But this is a project that needs a champion, or rather, it needs a variety of champions in different organisations across the parties because the South Stub has never been the top priority. It's never been straightforward, as Jimmy D outlined tonight. But I believe it could be a game changer. If we have a partnership between Sestrans, we look at the city deal options, we bring the rail partners into play, and we look at the connections between tram, bus, rail, and active travel. It needs all of those things to fit together. It needs us to have that vision but it needs more than cross-party support because I was the transport minister in the year 2000 and I didn't know about that historic trip on the South Sub. We need all of us to work together and crucially, we need the minister. And I'll miss his comments tonight, but I do hope the minister will be looking at bringing people together, will play a part as a Scottish government. It needs all of us to make this happen. And the benefits would be for the citizens of Edinburgh. And in my view, what's good for the citizens of Edinburgh is good for Edinburgh's economy, is good for the Lothian economy, and it's good for the Scottish economy. And for all those reasons, and for green transport, this is a project whose time has come, but it will not be easy, and therefore we need everybody's support, but crucially, the Minister's support. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Now I call on Cameron McCannon to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's certainly welcome that we have this chance to discuss the reinstatement of the Edinburgh Southern Railway, submitted by my friend Jim Eady. An upgraded transport infrastructure in the region I represent would be most welcome. This service could bring many benefits, not just in Edinburgh South, but across the Lothian region and even further afield. Furthermore, it is possible that the reinstatement could come at the cost that is eminently affordable when compared to other transport alternatives. Having said that, it is important that we do more than just talk about this Edinburgh Southern Suburban Railway. If we are to establish the facts and make genuine progress, we need to aim towards concrete measures that represent an actual step forward. With this in mind, I suggest that we focus our effort on securing funding for a much-needed feasibility study for the railway. The reinstatement of the Edinburgh Southern South Suburban Railway could bring a whole range of economic and social and environmental benefits that some of our MSPs have already touched on. These could include a boost to employment, reduced journey times when travelling across the city, and of course environment benefit benefits from, de from the decreased use of cars not to mention the welcome implications for reduced traffic levels in our city and less dependence on expensive city centre parking spaces. I'd also like to, to touch on the possible benefit my Conservative colleague, Mike, Mike Miles Briggs, has been raising awareness of, that this is the potential for an Edinburgh South suburban railway to serve as a university line, a fast link, as we've already heard, between the universities of Edinburgh, Napier and Queen Margaret would be a great boost for our city students, staff, businesses and other the wider, in the wider education sector. To date, this hasn't been mentioned cost-benefits debate around the ESSR, so we should certainly continue to raise awareness of this positive aspect of partnership with the relevant stakeholders. It's rather a new, as we've heard, a rather new um, line to take. As for the cost, this most recent study suggested the reinstatement of passenger services could cost somewhere in the region of 18 to 30 million pounds. This is a large amount of money in itself, but we must remember to consider it in context. That context should be the wide range of both direct and indirect benefits the railway would bring, as well as an understanding of the scale of recent budgets for transport projects. Given the scale of the reinstatement, though, I will reiterate my point that this must be crystal clear of the facts of the situation. This might, means we must need a new comprehensive feasibility study. It is indeed useful to debate the ESSR here in Parliament, We've talked about this for long enough, so we must make real progress 
and cross-party progress too in funding the new feasibility study. If only the Scottish ministers were, were to allocate funding for a study, we, I think we would gain a fuller understanding of the services that could be gained and who would benefit, how they would benefit and how much it would all cost. It is welcome that we have cross-party agreement for the moment anyway on the potential of the railway, but let us, let us take today's agreement and use it to make genuine progress. If the Scottish Government could commit to a funding study, we would see a genuine step forward towards the reinstatement of the railway, and I sincerely hope that the Minister will step up to the plate. Many thanks. Many thanks. Now I call on Alison Johnson to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I too would like to congratulate Jimmy Day for securing this debate this evening. Um, I would also like to thank the Capital Rail Action Group and Transform Scotland. Um, colleagues are right to point out the tremendous contribution that Lawrence Marshall in particular has made to this subject and also Colin Howden and Paul Tetlaw. And I sincerely hope that they are involved as we progress this important issue. I think this is a subject that is really close to my heart. Um, it has been Edinburgh Greens policy for as long as I can remember. And when I was looking back at the archives, if you have a quiet moment and you look on the Edinburgh Greens website, on the 11th of April 2007, we announced that reopening the South Suburban Railway Line was a priority for local Greens. But it's not just a priority for local Greens. I mean, this is a project that attracted massive input from business and support. Back in 2007, almost half of the then £15 million anticipated cost was pledged from local businesses and including Edinburgh University. So there is real support for this proposal and I don't think it would be difficult at all to gather that again. Because as we've heard, reopening the South Sub would have multiple benefits for local people, for local business and for the environment. It would help us tackle congestion. It's a convenient alternative to the car and to taking buses. If you look at the route of the South Sub, Waverley, Haymarket, Gorgie, Craig Lockhart, Morningside, Blackford Hill, Cameron Toll, Craig Miller, Nidri and Portobello. Currently, you're looking at taking buses into the centre in a lot of instances and then out again. You know, this just adds another dimension to Edinburgh's transport offering and a really important one, as Jim, Jim Eadie's highlighted you know, the kind of locations, the, the impact that it would have on people travelling to see, to see Hearts and all the students who are currently using Napier University. So I'm not terribly surprised that the Atkins feasibility study pointed out a 1.6 benefit cost ratio. I mean, this is certainly an idea whose time has come and it's well worth another look. And if the city continues to grow at its current pace, it's going to become essential I'm Edinburgh born and bred, I have spent my life in this city and there's no doubt at all that it is becoming increasingly gridlocked. So we do have to look at opportunities and alternatives. We also have to look at issues like climate change, something that's affecting us on a daily basis. Now, uh, there are benefits to looking at this scheme too. It exists currently. We wouldn't be starting from a standing start, as we've heard. Robin Harper, Margot MacDonald, David McCletchie used the train not that long ago. I've actually visited the Morningside station myself um, in the not too distant past. And the reason I was visiting it, somewhat sadly, is people had been using the land beside the, what would have been the platform as an allotment. Now, they were using that for some months and they were producing quite a lot of food, but Net Network Rail were concerned about the health and safety implications. So, that scheme came to a halt, but I do think it's important to suggest that it would be a far better use if that station was to reopen. I mean, Jimmy D, who represents Edinburgh Southern, will be only too well aware of what traffic is like on Morningside Road. You know, we're really talking about nose to tail, crawl, crawling along, people trying to reach various destinations um, from that neck of the woods. Jimmy D has also spoken about the developments in Sheffield. You know, technology is moving on all the time and I think it is fair to suggest that in the 21st century it is not beyond the wit of any progressive nation to make the most of an opportunity like this and to reopen the South Sub and I would be very pleased to work with anyone who is looking into this issue in the, in the weeks, months and years ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now Colin Stewart Stevenson to be followed by Dave Stewart. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I draw members' attention to my being the Honorary President of the Scottish Association for Public Transport and Honorary Vice President of Rail Future UK. 
In the light of that, it would be no surprise that I would always wish to engage in efforts to increase the availability and use of public transport. I, like others, congratulate Jim Eady on giving us the opportunity to debate this important subject for Edinburgh. Uh, when I was uh, Transport Minister, I responded to a Gavin Brown debate on the 3rd of December 2008 on this subject. Uh, at that time, I encouraged uh, the City of Edinburgh Council to meet with me as Minister uh, to discuss the issues around what were largely freight, freight lines, although probably, uh, if not less now, less uh, shortly. Uh, for passenger traffic. I don't actually recall that happening, so I very much welcome uh, hearing from Jim Eady that the Council are engaged in the issue. Uh, Jim Eady referred properly to the uh, issues of capacity and technical uh, issues as well uh, at our major stations, and in particular we ought to think too uh, about the issues for those stations of uh, connecting them to a high-speed rail network which may have different technical standards and will certainly have issues for platform length uh, and capacity. And we need to make sure that we work hand in glove to make sure if we do something on the suburban rail, we, we don't compromise our ability to connect to high-speed rail uh, in the future. So, would uh, South Suburban Railway Line be of value? Yes, of course it would. Uh, can it be done easily? No, it can't, for many of the reasons uh, that, that Jim E.D. Uh, referred to. Um, it's worth saying on platforms, uh, I think the issue is perhaps not quite as big as has been suggested. In most cases, it's simply been a question of putting a low platform at the end of the heavy rail high platform, and that's the solution that's been adopted elsewhere, because that depends on there being land available at the stations uh, uh, concerned. The motion says we should explore the viability of reopening the line for passenger use. Uh, we certainly should do that. I absolutely agree with that. Um, there has always been a need in Edinburgh for an inner or perhaps middle circle uh, around Edinburgh so that people, precisely as Alison Johnson referred to, don't have to come into the middle to just get in another bus to go back to the outside. And I think that has always been the missing link. And that's why, in uh, many ways, uh, we were uncomfortable as a political party with the trams proposal that ultimately got uh, implemented. Not because trams are a bad idea, they're a very good idea. But the route wasn't the one that perhaps was most urgently needed. And perhaps the route of the suburban railway uh, is the one that we need uh, most urgently. The one thing we do know is when you put rails down and you run trains on them, people come and use them. There's not a single development in the last couple of decades has not significantly exceeded estimations. Now, of course, that's in part because the model that estimates passenger usage is not a good model. It's a, U a GB network model, and it's an issue uh, we need to deal with. I was delighted as minister to be photographed with Madge Elliott, um, down in the borders uh, in my time. And, of course, that single individual saw from the last train that ran to the reopening uh, recently of the borders rail. Uh, now, of course, I can't talk about railways in Edinburgh without making the point that none of my communities in my constituency are anything less than one and a half hours bus ride away from a railhead. So my support for this proposal is entirely conditional on you also talking about and thinking about the Buckton Rail Link. I just conclude, Presiding Officer, by saying my enthusiasm for railways is substantial. My wife's Christmas present to me this year was David Spaven's Railway Atlas of Scotland. I commend it to you all. It shows what railways used to be like. Let's try and get some of the way back to uh, where we were. Not all the old railways were worth restoring, but many of them are. Edinburgh South Suburban, but even more important, Buchan Rail. Wonderful. Uh, Mr Stewart. Uh, uh, thank you, President Officer, and like other members, could I congratulate uh, Jim Eady and his initiative um, in uh, gaining uh, today's debate. And obviously I welcome the opportunity to speak in the debate uh, brought forward by Jim Eady. And as other members have done, I want to thank the Capital Rail Action Group and Transform Scotland for their ongoing campaign work aiming to reinstate the Edinburgh South Suburban Railway, which um, I strongly support. And it seemed to me when I was thinking about today that 
what we've got here is really a beaching in reverse. And I think some members were hinting that it was actually beaching that uh, was responsible for closing uh, the original rail link. But here we go. Uh, la last week, I had um, the opportunity to speak to Transform Scotland's first of their transport uh, hosting meetings. And at that time, I talked about the importance of looking at reinstating uh, previous lines. And obviously, Borders Rail was one I flagged up. And I think that's been a great initiative. I also want to note the, na the uh, timing of this debate in, in light of the National Transport Strategies report published just two weeks ago, uh, which revealed that the use of public transport in Scotland is down 6% since 2006, where traffic on our roads uh, is up 2%, although I do note uh, that rail was actually up 29%, which is something um, I'll be speaking to some of the rail operators tonight about that. That's something that's very positive. And within Edinburgh, the Capital Rail Action Group cites uh, data from the TomTom Tom Traffic Index, which was a new index to me, I have to say, uh, which measures the impact of congestion in a city's travel times by road. And, and that shows Edinburgh to be the world's fifth most congested small city, and they define small cities as population under 800,000. And when you take into account cities of all sizes, Edinburgh is actually the third most congested in the UK, and only London and Belfast have worst levels of congestion and is the 12th most congested city uh, in Europe. So Edinburgh must be one of the only capital cities in Europe which doesn't have uh, the model of suburban rail system uh, that we have talked about. Clearly that would have a big effect upon congestion. I don't have time for sign officer to talk about low emission zones, but I think I can see how that can relate in. Well, proceeds from that can go to local authorities uh, to help look at sustainable uh, transport. Now, the last feasibility study undertaken uh, looked at uh, reinstating the passenger service on the ESSR, suggested that if trains were to run every 15 minutes, uh, as the infrastructure currently remains, uh, and allows for up to 60 freight trains per day, the line could attract up to 13,500 uh, people daily. So I would strongly agree with Jimmy Dee's estimation that South Sub would uh, dramatically cut congestion and travel times within Edinburgh by helping to meet with uh, our, carbon emission, uh, our carbon emission ambitions. Now, Transport Scotland have previously stated that they must wait for an official uh, business case and structure proposal before they can take the project forward. Now, I don't think they can deny the success of the hybrid tram train models in other European countries. And I think most members uh, have, uh, have mentioned the great practice across the world on this. Um, and if we look at uh, Borders Rail reopening, which I touched on earlier, um, it's already reached um, the uh, 650,000 annual passengers, um, which is, I think, fantastic. Uh, and we must give praise about that new issue. But I would touch on the point that Stuart Stevenson made about looking at the methodology for predicting passenger numbers. I think that's something we've got to look at uh, in, the, in the longer term. Um, Germany, I think, is one of the best examples of tram train operations. Uh, it's seen a tremendous influx in patronage. If you look at before tram uh, train in Germany, there was around 2,000 daily uh, trips, and that's now currently 18,000 monitored along the same corridor. So best practice is there. Uh, I think it's a, a great initiative, and I would uh, wholeheartedly support the initiative in terms of providing a relief to congestion in Edinburgh and also tackling our climate change issues that we've got to address. Thank you. Thanks so much. I now call on the Minister. I have seven minutes or thereby, Minister. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I too would congratulate Jimmy Day on securing this debate. It does raise issues that are important to communities in and around uh, Edinburgh. His fundamental ask, apart from his reinstatement of totally of the south sub uh, rail uh, connections, was for uh, a meeting which I am happily uh, minded to agree to uh, a date uh, in my diary. Uh, to take uh, that uh, issue forward by way of uh, discussion. But I would want to stress that um, it would be important to bring uh, the Council leader uh, as well, because I think it's very important to have that local uh, engagement. Because what I detect in the Chamber is that cross-party consensus that this is a, an idea worth taking forward. But frankly, there must be clear evidence, support locally, and a willingness to see where that would go next. A feasibility study for its own sake I, I don't think it's worthwhile, but there has to be, of course. 
to the Minister for taking intervention. I do understand that the Scottish Government has to operate within the constraints of both feasibility and affordability, but the Scottish Government has been ambitious with other transport infrastructure projects. All that the Lothians MSPs are asking is that the Government keep an open mind on this issue, that it thinks outside the box, that it is prepared to um, look at innovative ideas that will contribute to the success not only of Edinburgh but of Scotland. I think in agreeing to have a meeting is showing that I am indeed open-minded, although we have no plans to uh, fund this project at the moment, and that is a point which uh, I want to return to, but I think it is certainly worth considering uh, the information that is there and the willingness from both the Transport Partnership and the Council, indeed if there is any willingness to take this forward, I need to hear that from those uh, organisations. I, I do believe that Jim, is very, Jim Media is very passionate uh, about this project. It is probably the number one issue he raises with me uh, regularly. He, he explained it is about opportunity, the economic and environmental connections that could be made, and in fairness also identified some of the challenges and how people may be able to think creatively about how they can be overcome. Sarah Boyat uh, is not here to, to hear that I have although she said she'll check the report, of course, that I've ag agreed to a meeting. But it does have the potential to be transformative and it will require a, a variety of champions. And then said over to you, Minister. Uh, but I like the plurality of that uh, position that it will need a number of people to support it if it's to go any further forward. Cameron Buchanan talked about the, the affordable uh, nature uh, of the project, but I can already identify that the costs that you have identified are different to the figures that I have, so it immediately raises questions about the cost of the scheme, hence I suppose a request for a feasibility um, study. Alison Johnson spoke about the Edinburgh Green website. It is not a website I am regularly on, uh, but I am happy to have a look to understand more of the local support uh, for this issue that has been expressed by members from across the political spectrum. And indeed, there are issues around land use and localism. And even if this is not going to be progressed with any speed not to be prejudiced against it. At least there is protection for the land and the halts to ensure that the option is there for the future, even uh, if not uh, now. Stuart Stevenson spoke about his ministerial experience, the importance of uh, council uh, engagement or, in a way, lack of it, that it was not deemed by the local authority to be their number one priority. And all I can say is in the discussions that have been had, around transport strategies and potentially a city deal or a deal for, for this part of the country, it has not been raised as something that is seen as a priority for that authority. And I think if it is a priority, they will certainly have to say so, and maybe that is why the meeting uh, will be of, of assistance with the local uh, authority. And of course, the, uh, many members have touched on the, 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 the popularity of rail, not least Stuart Stevenson, um, as well as David Stewart. Uh, who have spoken about the success story that is real right now. And that's very accurate. It, it, patronage has increased, and Border Rail is one of many uh, success stories in, in terms of investment. Curiously, this is the first time uh, that uh, David Stewart hasn't mentioned the Highland Main line when it comes to investment uh, in rail, which just goes to show uh, that everyone has their own interest and can put them to one side, apart from Stuart Stevenson, who, who of course, uh, managed to get in uh, the bucking uh, uh, rail connection. But I know there's demands from across the country to invest in rail. That's because of the popularity of it, because it's more sustainable. It delivers that modal shift that, that we all want to see and indeed can be affordable. But it does come at a cost. There are huge subsidies uh, to rail, but still with electrification, a form of transport that we absolutely support and have invested in to the tune of £5 billion, pounds, of course, with, with more to come and there is work ongoing looking at the potential of electrification of that route, albeit for potentially freight at the moment. Jamidi's interest in freight is well established through the committee work and is, is aware of uh, freight use uh, on the line as well. But all members have spoken very highly uh, about rail and I, I would agree uh, with that as Transport Minister. There's other investments that will benefit Edinburgh, such as Edinburgh and Glasgow Improvement Project, which is a substantial investment that will enhance the, the rail provision for the city and indeed the central belt. And you know, when those new. Uh, okay. Peter Stevenson. 
My apologies. Um, the Minister may recall the very ingenious engineering solution that was associated with electrification at Paisley Canal, where the price was brought down to about a third of the original budget by putting a dead section in that was unpowered. Um, does the Minister agree with me that there's a lot of great engineering uh, out there waiting to be applied to getting the price of some of our infrastructure developments down to affordable levels? while not in and of itself being a magic wand. Mr. Stuart Stevenson is absolutely right, but with the 42 seconds I have left, I don't think I can cover that and give justice. Take as long as you want, Minister. Oh, well, thanks for that, Presiding Officer. I don't think you really want me to go on at great length. But what I will say is that there's ongoing reviews into the operation of Network Rail, how it does its business, engineering costs and potential further devolution of rail to Scotland and in all of that, including the cost of Network Rail and the alliance we have in Scotland, there is certainly a much more I would like to see us do in terms of challenging costs and rolling out the good work that was established in the Paisley Canal uh, connection and further uh, rolling out um, uh, the investments in uh, infrastructure in rail in Scotland. But if I can return to rolling stock, when we have the new trains, the uh, uh, electric trains, the Hitachi trains coming to Scotland and the, the further use of the high speed rail within Scotland, the, the, those routes already established, we will have more trains in Scotland than ever before. And I think that's a great investment and the biggest ever investment in new rolling stock is being delivered at the same time. So there is massive investment uh, in rail. It is a success story. There is also ongoing work at the moment in terms of cross-boundary transport studies, in terms of current and projected future travel demand in the southeast of Scotland, of course, including Edinburgh. And I think that that can help inform some of this work uh, potentially too. But as I say, it will require the local authority and the transport partnership to reflect the, con the consensus that I've heard in the chamber today. And they have to say this is a priority for them to have any realistic prospect of moving on beyond a feasibility study for its own sake. But I've committed to, to discuss that uh, in detail uh, with partners uh, in the spirit that's been raised uh, in this uh, chamber. We are actively looking at our investment options for the future in terms of uh, rail beyond the control period of 2019. I've touched upon the planning process and the electrification options uh, before in the chamber that we're looking at uh, for the country's uh, uh, rail uh, infrastructure and the location is, is, is a potential for uh, electrification but it is for the freight use uh, at the moment and we can have further discussions uh, around uh, passenger use even though we've got no uh, immediate plans. I think there's uh, certainly scope to have that uh, more detailed conversation in view of the variety of transport conversations and dialogue that's happening at the moment, be it city deal aspirations, be it that wider transport study that I've suggested and the next control period. Uh, so uh, to be as constructive uh, as I can be, I'm happy to meet uh, and take uh, the issue uh, further, but I give a very strong message as Minister. I would want to see clear evidence from the Transport Partnership and the City Council uh, that this is a priority for them in that it can be taken seriously and not just seen as a nice to do, a wish list uh, from members. But my sense is certainly from Jim Eady that it's a priority for Jim and, and his uh, constituency. Uh, other parties have joined in and that therefore I'll give it further attention within the limitations that all members have very fairly reflected upon this evening. Very good. Many thanks. Thank you all for taking part in this important debate. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.